and I now look to Anna Wan, press officer, St. Peter's College, to open the case for the opposition. Madam President, thank you for the honor for letting me speak in this historic chamber tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. China and the West are not natural allies, but that doesn't mean that they have to be enemies. The rise of China is one of the greatest dramas the world has witnessed since the Big Bang, or since One Direction split up. You never really know which one's bigger. In only 30 years, the Chinese government has lifted almost half a billion people out of poverty. That's the equivalent of the entire continent of South America. Previously overlooked and underestimated, China has risen to become the biggest economy in the world. However, this hasn't happened with some mistakes on China's side and some tensions and challenges with other world powers. China's astronomical rise to the top of the world has raised issues for the West, and specifically America, who thought it was the world leader. China does many things well. Technology, education, making Peppa Pig a big star, selling fake designer gear that says tuna instead of puma, dolce and banana instead of dolce and gabbana. And the West is really worried, mostly about the trade part, not as much about Peppa Pig. In fact, people are so worried that they would propose the idea of starting a new Cold War with China, which is utterly inappropriate and dangerous. First of all, China is not the Soviet Union and does not pose the same or even a similar threat to the world. Second, we live in a globalized world where Cold War policies would have deeply damaging effects on the international economy. Hurting China is hurting the West. And the most important point, China and the West, most of all America, can coexist to build a safer, brighter world. But today, unfortunately, this paranoia-fueled game of brinkmanship on both sides is approaching a dangerous boiling point, or rather, a freezing point. It's approaching a Cold War. A zero-sum approach to China's role would elicit two responses from Beijing, to disengage from the system or to create a divided world order that would be damaging to Western interests. Neither of these are good options. Therefore, under no circumstance should a new Cold War be pursued or even encouraged, and under no circumstance would a Cold War benefit our world. But before I go any further, the great pleasure falls upon me to introduce our proposition speakers tonight. So you just heard from Mr. Arshan Barzani, a master's student at St. Anthony's. He's also a member of the union's secretaries committee, and Arshan's actually the author of a book that's now out on Amazon. The description for it reads, for the first time ever, Napoleon's Chronicles of Caesar's Wars is available in English. Now, I hope that when Mr. Barzani gets home after this debate, he can sit down at his desk and also translate his own argument into a coherent one. <laughs> Speaking second will be Miss Anastasia Lin. Miss Lin is a Chinese actress, beauty queen, and humans advocate. She does it all. She was ruled a persona non grata by China in 2015 for her advocacy. Now, this happened when Chinese officials banned Miss Lin from entering the Miss World pageant, which was being held in China that year. But Miss Lin didn't just give up. She planned to enter the country by requesting a visa when her flight landed in China. Basically, the strategy was to show up anyways and hope the government wouldn't want to look bad or cause a scene because she already came all that way. Now, I've used this same technique to try to get into parties I wasn't invited to, <laughs> but it turns out the Chinese government is a little bit more strict than a fraternity brother. <laughs> and closing for the proposition tonight will be Mr. Michael Pillsbury. Mr. Pillsbury is the American director of the Center of Chinese Strategy. He's the author of multiple books about China and one of President Trump's top advisors on China. Now, an article says that a persistent misconception is about his wealth. It's reflected in his posh Georgetown home. People think that his wealth comes from the Pillsbury flower fortune of doughboy fame. Mr. Pillsbury said that he hails from a different branch of the family, but he refuses to discuss his money in detail. Can't talk about it, he said. 
It's a mystery. Maybe tonight. <laughs> <laughs> to which I say, watch out, James Bond. There is a new international man of mystery in the house, and his name is Pillsbury, Michael Pillsbury. <laughs> All jokes aside, it's truly my honor to speak alongside such esteemed guests tonight. Madam President, these are your speakers, and they are most welcome. So I'll begin with my first point tonight. China is not the Soviet Union. China has a drastically different background and philosophy that motivates its unique aims and goals. The West has seen China as a monolith time and time again. The West has neglected to understand the history that propels living, breathing policies that the government makes, therefore running the risks of making the same mistakes again. China carries a painful, lingering memory of its century of humiliation, a 109-year period where it was forced to give up territory and sign unequal treaties. This collective memory makes it difficult to work on trade issues where China feels like it is again being threatened by Western demands. The Chinese Communist Party was founded nearly a century ago on a promise of putting a stop to this humiliation at the hands of the West. Today, the government uses this concept of national rejuvenation to transcend a memory of national humiliation. China now has an official policy of peaceful development where it understands that without peace, there is no chance to grow economically. And without economic power, China cannot have peace because it fears being victimized by foreign aggressors. This concept of peaceful development contrasts a lot to Soviet doctrines of expansion and occupation. Further, China is now richer and more stable than the Soviet Union ever was. The Soviet Union was a declining power with a failing economic model. But within the next decade, China's economy is set to overtake America's by all economic measures. China is a different kind of superpower than the Soviet Union was, and therefore must be handled differently. The Cold War was concerned with military spending, which is no longer relevant. America already spends more than twice what China does on military. But by focusing on this military perspective, Washington risks misusing strategic resources that could be devoted to new economic initiatives. Denied. Further, China is not a monolith. Its rapid rise has been because of its willingness to adapt and attempt new approaches in every sphere of life. Although its growth has pushed it into a more competitive international role, many Chinese leaders know that a more moderate, collaborative approach with the West is the wisest one. However, this framing of China as the enemy by the West has created an adversarial narrative that makes it difficult for these moderate views to rise to the top. A better balance of competition and cooperation in American actions can support these leaders who have reason. Besides the fact that China is not the Soviet Union, we don't even live in that same world anymore. It's clearly not the 1960s anymore. People don't smoke on planes. They don't make that jello salad thing anymore. There isn't lead in every toy. We don't live in fear of asbestos. It's not even the 1970s. People don't purchase water beds. People don't wear bell-bottom jeans, thank God. People don't trust mood rings. They don't own pet rocks. It's incredible. Personally, the only relic of the 70s that I want to bring with me is the dynamic Swedish supergroup, ABBA. Other than ABBA, all of the things seem like good things to leave in the past. So if we're bringing ABBA and leaving the rest of it, then why would we bring this antiquated, anachronistic, and harmful idea of a Cold War with us? In the world we live in today, in 2020, a Cold War with China would be suicide. America's efforts to treat China like an enemy and exclude it from the world economy may serve to damage America itself and compromise the economy of all the other countries it's involved with. China's foreign policy and its attitudes towards the West are largely determined by how the West itself perceives China. So when the West perceives China with xenophobic sentiment, it hurts this relationship further. The recent coronavirus has been a devastating and timely reminder of how the pain of one nation, especially China, can be felt by the rest of the world. And it's also a lesson in the importance of supporting each other at such a hard time. At a time when China's rise as a global and economic power has unsettled its neighbors in China and Asia, as well as its rivals in the West, 
the coronavirus is feeding into prejudice against Chinese people all around the world. In a globalized 2020, our world is hopelessly intertwined, and there are no clear blocks anymore. During the Cold War, Moscow and Washington operated in completely separate trading spheres and competed with each other for trade from third parties. That's not the case today. There is no simple win or lose situation that existed before. A Cold War is a zero-sum game for both the US and China, which will drag down both countries and with them, the rest of the world. Denied. And even if a Cold War was feasible, the West should not start one because maybe it wouldn't win. Even if the West could win a Cold War, the idea shouldn't even be considered because China and the West can peacefully coexist. By reaching agreements on contentious issues, America and China can create space to cooperate on challenges like global terrorism and climate change, where the national interests the two powers share are much greater than what divides them. The West needs to question the whole reason it considers a Cold War with China. Basically, it's fear that China will overthrow it and unseat the modern world order. Even though China has built itself up at an incredible speed, does it have the ability or the will to be the leader of the free world, to be a world policeman? The answer is no. A constructive response from America is to work with allies to continue creating a more open and prosperous world and invite China to participate. The threat that China poses to the West is smaller than many may believe. China has even less interest in going to war with America than America does going to war with China. It's true that China's behavior has been alarming to the world, and in some cases, rightfully so. It's domestic conflicts with the Uyghur minority. It's reneging on trade talks. It's increased state control over private firms. These do raise issues for the rest of the world, and they do require a firm response, but Cold War is not that response. Now the West, from the age of the Opium Wars and before, has consistently known what it has wanted from China. Goods, trade, technology. But it needs to ask itself what it wants for China. We should want to see China succeed. The world needs China to remain stable, productive, and wealthy to propel international growth. The world needs China to play a constructive international role and collaborate with other governments to make global changes and China needs the same from the West. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'm asking you to vote nay to starting a Cold War with China. In our world, the Chinese government is not seeking to destroy the Western way of life as the Soviet Union was seen to be doing. China and the West have similar goals and should be seen as formidable rivals and critical partners. For better or for worse, the Sino-American relationship will define the century. Competition is inevitable but both sides must manage it constructively. If the relationship is not properly handled, with the US trying to derail China's development and contain its rise, and China continuing to assert its power and world dominance, a Cold War could ensue and swallow the world whole. At the end of the day, these larger-than-life stories of war and peace forget the most basic units of action, human beings. Humans are the ones making these decisions. Humans are the ones who will be hurt by these decisions. My parents are immigrants who grew up during the Cultural Revolution in China. They worked hard, and they were fortunate enough to immigrate to America to pursue graduate school. Now, when they got to this unfamiliar land without family or friends, they had one suitcase and a few hundred dollars. They were able to build a life, a family, a work, home, education, and contribute to their new country. While they are proud to be American citizens, China does have a special place in their heart. But this conflict, a cold war between the West and China puts 50 million people like them in an impossible situation, forcing them to choose where their loyalties lie. If a cold war takes place, what happens to them? Will we be interned like the Japanese during World War II? Will we be banned from one third of America like the Russians during the Cold War? Will we be suspected of betrayal and used as pawns? If a cold war is waged, it takes away the ability to hope to dream of a better future, because the only future that lies ahead will be in fear and doubt. The aspirations of generations to come will be put on hold. A Cold War makes this world a place that belongs to nobody, when really, it belongs to everybody. My family's story is not just the American dream, it's the world's dream, and it's not just about Chinese immigrants, it's about every immigrant. 
If this relationship between the West and China will define the world, it will define you. Thank you.